Hi. Um, right now I'm reading this devotional called Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. It's a 40-day devotional book where you get devotions every single day. And it's so good. Um, <laughs> and I really wanted to share this one. I read it today. And it's so good. It's kind of long, so, you know, bear with me. But, yeah, I want to share it because it, it's, it's just so good. So, the title is Plan for God's Pleasure. And the verse is Revelation 4, verse 11. It says, You created everything, and it is for your pleasure that they exist and were created. The second verse is Psalms 149, verse 4. It says, The Lord takes pleasure in his people. Okay, then the devotional says, You are planned for God's pleasure. The moment you were born into the world, God was there as an unseen witness, smiling at your birth. He wanted you alive, and your arrival gave him great pleasure. God did not need to create you, but he chose to create you for his own enjoyment. You exist for his benefit, his glory, his purpose, and his delight. Bringing enjoyment to God, living for his pleasure, is the first purpose for your life. When you fully understand this truth, you will never again have a problem with feeling insignificant. It proves your worth. If you are that important to God and he considers you valuable enough to keep with him for eternity... What greater significance could you have? You are a child of God, and you bring pleasure to God like nothing else he has ever created. The Bible says, because of his love, God has already decided that through Jesus Christ, he would make us his children. This was his pleasure and purpose. One of the greatest gifts God has given you is the ability to enjoy pleasure. He wired you with five senses and emotions so you can experience it. He wants you to enjoy life, not just endure it. The reason you are able to enjoy pleasure is that God has made you in His image. We often forget that God has emotions too. He feels things very deeply. The Bible tells us that God grieves, gets jealous and angry, and feels compassion, pity, sorrow, and sympathy, as well as happiness, gladness, and satisfaction. God loves, delights, gets pleasure, rejoices, enjoys, and even laughs. Bringing pleasure to God is called worship. The Bible says, The Lord is pleased only with those who worship Him and trust His love. Anything you do that brings pleasure to God is an act of worship. Like a diamond, worship is multifaceted. I'm going to put the word on the screen because I don't know how to pronounce it. But anyways, um, worship is that word. (laughs) It would take volumes to cover all there is to understand about worship, but we will look at the primary aspects of worship in this section. Anthropologists have noted that worship is a universal urge, hand-wired by God into the very fiber of our being, an inbuilt need to connect with God. Worship is as natural as eating or breathing. If we fail to worship God, we will always find a substitute, even if it ends up being ourselves. The reason God made us with this desire is that he desires worshipers. Jesus said, the Father seeks worshipers. (laughs) Anything you do that brings pleasure to God is an act of worship. Depending on your religious background, you may need to expand your understanding of worship. You may think of church services with singing, praying, and listening to a sermon. Or you may think of ceremonies, candles, and communion. Or you may think of healing, miracles, and ecstatic experiences. Worship can include these elements, but worship is far more than these expressions. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is far more than music. For many people, worship is just a synonym for music. They say, at our church, we have the worship first and then the teaching. This is a big misunderstanding. Every part of a church service is an act of worship. Praying, scripture reading, singing, confession, silence, being still, listening to a sermon, taking notes, giving an offering, baptism, communion, signing a commitment card, even greeting other worshipers. Actually, worship predates music. Adam worshipped in the Garden of Eden, but music isn't mentioned until Genesis 4 verse 21 with the birth of Jubal. If worship were just music, then all who were non-musical could never worship. Worship is far more than music. Even worse, worship is often misused to refer to a particular style of music. First we sing a hymn, then a praise and worship song, or I like the fast praise songs, but enjoy the slow worship songs the most. 
In this usage, if a song is fast or loud or uses brass instruments, it's considered praise. But if it is slow and quiet and intimate, maybe accompanied by a guitar, that's worship. This is a common misuse of the term worship. Worship has nothing to do with the style or volume or speed of a song. God loves all kind of music because he invented it all. Fast and slow, loud and soft, old and new. You probably don't like it all, but God does. If it is offered to God in spirit and truth, it is an act of worship. Christians often disagree over the style of music used in worship. Passionately defending their preferred style is the most biblical or God-honoring. But there is no biblical style. There are no musical notes in the Bible. We don't even have the instruments they used in the Bible times. Frankly, the music style you like best is more about you, your background and personality, than it does about God. One ethnic group's music can sound like noise to another, but God likes variety and enjoys it all. There is no such thing as Christian music. There are only Christian lyrics. It is the words that make a song sacred, not the tune. There are no spiritual tunes. If I played a song for you without the words, you'd have no way of knowing if it were a Christian song. Worship is not for your benefit. As a pastor, I receive notes that say, I love the worship today. I got a lot out of it. This is another misconception about worship. It is not for our benefit. We worship for God's benefit. When we worship, our goal is to bring pleasure to God, not ourselves. If you've ever said, I didn't get anything out of worship today. You worship for the wrong reason. Worship isn't for you, it's for God. Of course, most worship services also include elements of fellowship, edification, and evangelism. And there are benefits to worship. But we don't worship to please ourselves. Our motive is to bring glory and pleasure to our Creator. In Isaiah 29, God complains about worship, that it is half-hearted and hypocritical. The people were offering stale prayers, insincere praise, empty words, and man-made rituals without even thinking about the meaning. God's heart is not touched by tradition and worship, but by passion and commitment. The Bible says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up of only rules taught by men. Worship is not a part of your life. It is your life. Worship is not just for church services. We are told to worship him continually and to praise him from sunrise to sunset. In the Bible, people praise God at work, at home, in battle, in jail, and even in bed. Praise should be the first activity when you open your eyes in the morning and the last activity when you close them at night. David said, I will thank the Lord at all times. My mouth will always praise him. Every activity can be transformed into an act of worship when you do it for the praise, glory, and pleasure of God. The Bible says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Martin Luther said, a dairy maid can milk cows to the glory of God. How is it possible to do everything to the glory of God? By doing everything as if you were doing it for Jesus and by carrying on a continual conversation with him while you do it. The Bible says, whatever you do, work at it with all your hearts as working for the Lord, not for men. This is a secret to a lifestyle of worship, doing everything as if you were doing it for Jesus. The message paraphrase says, take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Work becomes worship when you dedicate it to God and perform it with an awareness of his presence. When I first fell in love with my wife, I thought of her constantly, while eating breakfast, driving to school, attending class, waiting in a line at the market, pumping gas. I could not stop thinking about this woman. I often talked to myself about her and thought about all the things I loved about her. <laughs> this helped me feel close to Kay, even though we lived several hundred miles apart and attended different colleges. By constantly thinking of her, I was abiding in her love. And this is what real worship is all about, falling in love with Jesus. And it just says, a point to ponder was, I was planned for God's pleasure. A verse to remember is Psalms 149 verse four. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. And then a question to consider, 
is, what common task could I start doing as if I were doing it directly for Jesus? Now a common task could be brushing your teeth in the morning. You know, it's taking care of the temple God gave you, praising him that you can do that. You know, that you have the ability and the resources to care for yourself. It could be driving to work, praising him because you have a vehicle and you have your license. Most kids would, you know, love to have that. And just, there's so many little things in our life that we don't even realize we're privileged to have. So if we just like take a step back and just like, wow, thank you, Jesus, for your goodness and your presence in my life and how you've just been there for me through everything. Like, he's just so worthy of our praise. And while I was reading this, it made me really think about the part where it says that worship is not for our benefit. And it just gave an example of how someone was saying they didn't get anything out of worship today. And it's because they worship for the wrong reason. That really stuck to me because there's a few times where I'll be worshiping at church and the song's just like not doing it for me or the band's not the best in my opinion. And it's just hard for me to really connect with God and hard for me to worship, you know, to raise my hands and just give thanks to God and feel God's presence. But it, you know, it was really just like hit me. Like it's not about me. It's not about the feeling I get during worship. Because I love worshiping the Lord. I feel so good afterwards, most of the time. I just feel so connected to Jesus and so just at peace and happy and full of praise towards the Lord. But that doesn't mean that worship is for my benefit, because it's not. Worship is a way to praise the, praise the Lord and to just honor Him and thank Him. And I think that was a really cool point that they made in this book. Um, yeah, so the next time we worship with songs, I think, well, I'm going to try to fully worship the Lord for his benefit. Because, you know, God is always worthy of our praise, no matter how I'm feeling. I should still want to raise my hands. I should still want to try to engage with the song and try to pray through the worship, even though I don't feel it necessarily, just to still want to honor God and give him thanks through my worship, you know? Because another thing is, like, if I'm standing up at church, I sit in, like, the front row, so if I'm standing up in church worshiping the Lord, and then my friend next to me, you know, might feel uncomfortable raising their hands during worship, but if I'm doing that because I'm praising God, because he's just always worthy of my praise, that can encourage them to feel comfortable to raise their hands during worship because they may feel really strongly connected to God during that song, even though I don't. Does that make sense? <laughs> like, God can use every single moment in our lives to bring glory to Him and to help someone else if we're just obedient to Him and just always trying to bring in praise and worship Him. Just like it said, at work you can just talk with Him, you know? Like this author talked about how when he fell in love with his wife, he was always thinking of her and assuming talking to God about her and just abiding in her love. And that's what we should be like with Jesus. You know, we should always be talking to him, always having him on our minds, always praising him, always, it could be cracking a joke with Jesus, whatever it is, like he has a sense of humor. So I just encourage you, so I'm going to start doing it too. Start incorporating Jesus every single day into your life. Every single second of your life. Let it bring glory to the Lord. Because he made you. Like he made the spirit and temple. Like he made you. That's so cool. Like you literally were knit together in your mother's womb by God, the creator of the universe. He chose to have you here. You're here for a reason. He has such a cool plan and purpose for your life. And all we have to do is like spread the gospel and like worship and praise him and just let him do what only he can do in your life and let him move. And that's so cool and exciting that he's just so present in our life and just wants the best for us. And his love doesn't ever fail. How cool is that? Like, that's so cool. Jesus loves us no matter what. We don't get that here on earth. 
people's love here is for the most part very circumstantial you know if you do something wrong that might like tick them off and like make them not be kind to you that doesn't happen with jesus when we sin he's not mad at you he's not that's why god sent his son to die on the cross because he knew that born in this world we're sinners we're going to sin we're gonna fall short of the glory to god like we're gonna sin again and again there are certain sins god can free us from but even little like even sin every sin is the same size every sin has the same volume so if you're lying that's a sin you should repent and ask god for forgiveness and he's gonna forgive you he's not standing there you know looking down at you watching you sin and just saying oh i'm so angry he doesn't do that <laughs> if you're feeling that way that's the enemy that's the devil doing that to you um god will always love you no matter what and he's always gonna forgive you if you just humble yourself before the lord and ask him to forgive you he's gonna forgive you but he's never angry with you he loves you so much and um yeah don't ever let the enemy have a foothold on you don't ever let him make you believe that god is angry with you or that God doesn't like you, or that God's judging you, because he doesn't. He's not. He doesn't. He doesn't. Judgment will happen from the Lord. But not right now. We don't know when. There will be a time where you're going to be before God, and he's going to judge you for everything you did here on earth. Not to freak you out, but you can read about it in Revelation. That's It's going to happen. But that's why during this time, we just got to go closer to the Lord. Um, I know when you get closer to God, your life can sometimes get worse just because you're not living for the world anymore. So the worldly people around you are going to probably be confused and you might feel a little uncomfortable and a little out of place. But Jesus told us that would happen. Like we don't belong to this world at all. And the second you realize that, the second you um, remind yourself that heaven's literally your home, like that's where you, you're going to spend eternity if you follow Jesus. You're not going to want anything from this world. You're going to feel out of place. You're going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to feel like a stranger on earth. But that's such a good feeling because you get to stand out. You get to show the love of Christ. You get to be a light for the Lord. And it's just so wonderful. So, yeah, God will always love you. He loves you so much and he just wants your heart. He wants your worship. He wants your praise. He wants your life. He wants you to let him move in your life because he has such good things planned for you. If you just let him, let him move. Um, yeah, God loves you so deeply. And I just pray that this devotional really impacts you in such a good life-changing way because God is so good and life-changing. So I just pray this helped you in some way. Um, yeah. Worship's not for our benefit, it's to worship and give praise to the Lord. So I pray that next time you feel like worshiping to a song, you'll remember that it's not for my gain. It's not like, oh, what can I gain from this? It's like, Lord, I love you, and it's just giving him praise and thanks. And also, you know, when you wake up in the morning, talk to God. When you go to bed, talk to God. Let his praise be always on your lips. He loves you, and he's always going to be with you here on earth. Um, there's no greater time than now to give your life to the Lord. And just always talk to him. Surround yourself with the Lord. Talk to him. Think about him all the time. You know, crack a joke. Whatever it is, whatever you're comfortable with, it's your relationship with God. But, um, yeah, worship's not a part of your life. It is your life. Worship is not just church services. Worship is thinking about him, praising him, thanking him, praying to him, you know, being kind to a friend. Anything you do that brings glory, that brings glory to God, I would say is worship. But, yeah. Anyways, I hope this helped you in some way. Um, yeah, God loves you so much. And it's all about the Lord. It's all about falling in love with Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. You know, you give him your yes. You know, you give your life to God, let him move. He's gonna do it and it's gonna be so beautiful. Um, 
He's just such a good, good father, and he wants the best for you. Yeah, I hope this helps you in some way. Um, I hope it sticks with you, because it's important. This is really good stuff in this book. But, yeah. God is so good, and he loves you. And I hope this touched your heart in some way or another. Yeah. God bless you. Have a good rest of your day.